everybody out there in podcast land. Uh, welcome back to the Philosophy Podcast. We're now doing it on YouTube and on Spotify, Apple, and all the usual places. First and foremost, I hope everybody out there is staying safe and relatively healthy. Um, I want to give a shout out to a few people. I have a couple of high school classmates who lost their dad during this, and that's just tragic that they not from COVID, but that they don't get to say bye in the proper way we're used to. So shout out to Sean Fitzgerald, Fitzy, I love you, buddy. And Trish, Trisha O'Connell, uh, love you too. Hope your families are doing the best that you can. Also a very special shout out to uh, Nancy Dicker, who is the wife of a good friend of mine, Tommy Dicker, who's been on the podcast. She is a nurse at Newton Wellesley Hospital in Newton, Massachusetts, and has contracted uh, COVID. She's in bed and resting at home and doing well. Uh, I understand that it's a pretty serious illness and she's been stuck in bed for days. So I want to let you guys know that I'm thinking about you. Along those lines, I've started a new GoFundMe called Free Philosophy Talks for Heroes, Kids and Families. Uh, go to GoFundMe. If you help this campaign, what I'm doing is free talks like this on Zoom but with heroes that are dealing with difficult times, kids that don't know what to think about all this, and families that are stuck together and trying to figure out how to do the best that they can. So I've been trying to think for weeks what's the best way that I can help and keep my business going, and this was the perfect meeting point of doing both. I can't do live talks right now, but I can talk to a lot more people because I don't have to travel. So I'm doing the podcast. Uh, I've got the free Zelosophy Talks. Zelosophy TV with Uncle Z and Friends is on YouTube. Episode 1 is up. I've told you before and I'll tell you again, I've got a ton of footage already shot for Episode 2, so I just got to get to some time to edit it. Now that I've got my GoFundMe campaign and I know what I'm doing with Zelosophy, um, that will be a big help in getting that done. Of course, you've got this podcast. You've got my book, which I forgot to bring back out with me, but it's Zelosophy on Golf. It's available on Amazon in paperback, uh, Kindle, and audiobook. It's a great time to catch up on reading or listening if you're not a big reader. It is on audiobook. I'm not going to take too much more time in this intro. I've already gone longer than I wanted because we have a long show for you today and a great show. I've got Jason Gore, my good friend and college classmate from Pepperdine, who is a professional golfer, wrote the foreword to Zelosophy on Golf, uh, has been a big supporter, now works for the USGA as the, I have his title written down here somewhere, Senior Director of Player Relations. As you can imagine, they're going through a lot trying to figure out what they're uh, going to do this summer and beyond. We don't get a lot into the details of that because they're still speculating and they don't know what they're going to do. And I didn't want to put Jason on the spot with that stuff. But we talked a lot about golf and life. And it's not just Jason. We've got our good friend Tyler Scheiblick with us, who was a fan of Jason's as a little kid, uh, followed him for years. He and his dad became good friends with Jason. They've now become good friends of mine. We met a couple years ago at a golf tournament and have stayed in touch. Tyler is a very impressive young man, as I say in the podcast. He's someone who gives me hope that uh, when we hear all this bad stuff about the young generation and their entitlements and how you know aloof they are and whatever, just like we all were at that age, um, He's someone who gives me hope that there are a lot of young people out there that get it, that are trying to do their best, uh, not just for themselves, but for the greater, <coughs> excuse me, the greater good. So here we go. We're going to end the intro now, and it's the Zelosophy Podcast with Jason Gore and Tyler Scheiblick coming up next. <music> Recording with Jason Gore and Tyler Scheiblick. How you doing, guys? It's good. It's good I'm bad. How about you? How's life? A little boring lately? Anything exciting happening? <laughs> <laughs> so it's trying to find stuff to stay busy, you know? Yeah. So uh, most people that are watching this would know who Jason Gore is. Uh, may or may not know he uh, was a college friend of mine. We went to Pepperdine together. He was uh, gracious enough to write the foreword of my book philosophy on golf uh, tour player for many years now working for the usga which we just agreed we're not really going to talk about in specific <laughs> we will talk about in theory like what it's like to have a job like that but um, let me introduce tyler to the group for those who don't know him uh he's not many do 
good friend of ours. Yeah, but I think they will, which is why I drug you on here with us. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you were, I met you at uh, the Quicken Loans in 2018 when we were following Jason mm-hmm. uh, when he was still playing. And um, you were a fan of Jason's and became a friend of Jason's. And then through mm-hmm. that became a friend of mine. And I, and I think you're a pretty impressive young man. And uh, appreciate that. Someone that uh, gives me hope about the future. You know, it's easy for us old folks, Jay, to lament about youth and how entitled and all the crap we hear and talk about, right? But uh, then you see a kid like Tyler and you're like, oh my God, I think we're going to be okay. I think yeah. <laughs> hopefully there's enough people out there like this. So that's why we're all here. Um, I wanted to start with uh, yesterday would have been the final round of the Masters. And for three golf nerds like us, that's a crushing blow. For me, it was one of the first times I realized how real this was getting very quickly when they postponed the Masters. I was like, oh, no, this is, this is going to get bad. Um, but I got to rewatch Tyler's incredible comeback. So I just wanted to talk about that in the space of, you know, us being golf nerds and feel normal for a few minutes in this group. Jay, you grew up competing against uh, Tiger and Tyler, you know, you grew up in a time where he was struggling and then you got to see the, the incredible comeback. I think it's not just a great sports story. I think it goes way beyond that. I, to me, it's a great human story. Right. For sure. For sure. It's um, talk about that, Jay. You know, just it was the first time I, I watched it again yesterday. I actually watched it last night on, on the, the, the app, the master's app on Apple TV. But um, it was one of those things where you actually saw guys crumble around him again. <laughs> yeah. You know, like you saw that in 2000 where everybody would just kind of be like, Oh my gosh, there he is. We're just going to like move out of the way. We're going to, we're going to merge out of the way. And just, and last year was the first time in a long time where you saw guys kind of do that. And, and it was, it was good to kind of see that happen. I mean, Maybe not good for them, but good for the game to kind of see, you know, to see, how do I put this? To see that kind of like aura and dominance for, yeah. for Tiger. It was like, it was like taking a, it was like almost being in a time capsule and you just, you know, when he's getting around there and he's lurking around that lead that, that somehow, some way he's going to find a way to win. And even if he doesn't personally find a win, way to win, the people around him are going to find a way for him to win. And it was just, uh, it was just kind of cool to watch how everything kind of unfolded. And he just took advantage of the opportunities. And for you, a guy that you had a front row seat to all of it. And, you know, we've, I was chuckling the last podcast I did was with a sports uh, radio guy from Boston, who's a big golf fan. Uh, and he, we were joking about how these kids were wishing they could compete against Tiger at his best because that's what they grew up dreaming to do. And that's the perfect reaction. No, you do not want to no, do don't. that. No, no, no. They had a perfect seat. You just learn from them. <laughs> yeah, if you enjoy second place, maybe you'd enjoy yeah, against them. Yeah, them. no. They, I mean, it was great to play in that era, you know, like to play against him and, and you know, to say, you know, you can look back on your kids and or your grandkids and say, you know, I played against that guy. But um, – yeah, he was – you You walked up to the range and you're like, oh, there he is. <laughs> it was, you, know, you, knew, you knew where he was on the golf course. You knew where he was on the range. And, and I've known him since I was, you know, 12 years old, so I was pretty comfortable with him. So I'd walk up and just say, like, yeah. you know, I'd call him Eldrick or whatever, you know, just because that's who he was to me, you know. It's like – Right. But – um you know, like even during some of this stuff that's been going on, like every now and again, he, he's called me like a couple times and I look down at my phone and see his name come across. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like <laughs> you have tiger PTSD. Yeah. It's like, like, what, what, what do you want? What, like, you know, I was Are you going to take another trophy from me? If I yeah, like, this. <laughs> please, please don't. I, um, but uh, like I'm on the phone with, Brett Quigley talking about, you know, some of the U.S. Senior Open stuff and Tiger calls. And I'm like, how do I t- 
tell Tiger I'm going to call him back? Like, do I just, like, how do I just, like, this how is the do I moment you've been waiting for. You're right. right. How do I red button Tiger Woods and just hang be like, on, hang, on. hang on, Tiger. You're not, it's not your turn yet. You know, like, but, uh, but yeah. Tyler, you got to, we got to actually experience a little bit of that when we were at the quick end. Uh, yeah. I, I had rarely experienced that because I didn't go to a lot of live tournaments or any when he was in the heart of it. Uh, I was fortunate enough. My first live experience of Tiger was when, I think he won six tournaments in a row in 2007 or six starts in a row right. um, at the Deutsche Bank. I mean, we were literally a foot away from him on one of the holes. And just the, that was the first experience I had. And the sound of the golf ball was just a different sound. And I was very young, and I, I'll always remember that moment. Really because the guy next to me said Tiger was probably hitting like a four iron from about 170. And my dad chuckled, and the guy didn't know why he chuckled. And, he really ripped a seven iron in there, but um. So I a soft, a soft seven at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I cut. Yeah. So um, I that was my first experience of him, and like you said, unfortunately, you know, I kind of grew up in the era where the injuries took a toll on him. But I was able to remember the younger part of him, and then obviously last year, I mean, who didn't love that? I don't know who was rooting against him. I don't know anyone that was like, oh, I hope Tiger doesn't win. I was watching the end of that. My brother had just came in who walked by a few minutes ago. And uh, they, after he won and hugged his kids and all that, Jim Nance with one of the all-time lines that if, if there's not a tear in your eye, you're not human. <laughs> it's, and, and that's what I mean. I mean, like, it's a great sports story and great for golf nerds like us to, like, watch that and see the comeback from he didn't know if he was going to play again. But the human story of here's a guy who was – arguably the greatest of all time or certainly right there um, and then to go through the personal and physical things that he went through to think that this could all be taken away and to see him come all the way back and get all the way back to the top was just pretty impressive and incredible to watch he, he I think that's what kind of made John Daly so human to all of us you know because he kind of went through the ups and the downs and yeah we enjoyed his victories and and you know walked with him in his lows and and i think tiger was on such a pedestal that that um we all just enjoyed watching him be great and then when you know he had his 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 problems you know and feel you know feel for him how you you did either you loved him Either you supported him or you hated him. Either you wanted to see him come back and shoot 65 or you wanted to watch him shoot 85. You were still watching him one way or another. And I think when you, you watch the human transgression of if him coming back to, to being back on top, you almost had to just kind of forget everything and just look at him as an athlete again and just... Well, it, you know. he was the first time we saw him be humbled. I mean, yeah. again, you since the age of 12, and it started way before that even, he was never humbled because he was just so good. Yeah. And do anything on and off the course that he wanted, right? And um, I think that's why it's such a great story is he had to go through the humility of becoming a better person for him to get back to where he wanted to be. Which is, you know, really the again the whole hypothesis of the book is that right. working on things that make you a better person will make you a better golfer. Right. I've said many times the best compliment I've ever gotten about that book is a guy told me at a golf clinic, "I love your book. It's made me a better golfer. More importantly, it's made a better dad." And uh, you know, that almost brought a tear to my eye. That's yeah. the whole point to trick golfers into being better people, <laughs> and <laughs> use that as just starting with golfers. Everybody in the world needs that, right? How do we tr all trick each other into being our best? Yeah, I mean, but that's 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 why golf's so great. It's because it's such a you know microcosm of life. You can take yeah. so many little lessons that golf mm -hmm. has given you and transfer it over to to life and. Yeah, you said one of the great quotes ever when I showed you the book. And to, when, I, when I told you about the book, I didn't, you hadn't even read it yet. You said, I've been waiting for this book my whole life. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. I mean, it's just, you know, you, you go through life and you, you pick up little things and you, you don't really think about it. And all of a sudden you, you, you put two and two together and you're like, well, there it is. Right. That's, what, that's what your book kind of brought was like, oh, okay. 
yeah, I get it now. That, that it's, you can put all these together and, and then they work. And one of those lessons that's in the book and a great thing that, that golf teaches us is just when you think you have it figured out, whack. <laughs> you don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. but, you're, but you're better prepared. <laughs> right. I, I feel like uh, this book was really like you, you followed my life around my whole life and wrote about me, honestly, because like you said, not even golf wise, it just talks about the challenges in lives and how to overcome them and just, you know, your person. Like for me, one of the big things was um, like chapters three through six or holes three through six was the confidence in keeping thoughts in check. That really kind of hit home to me, just not even in golf, just in life. I'm like, wow, this is actually seems like it's literally about me. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a really incredible compliment because what I tried to do was write about me in hopes that everybody would find a way to identify with it. I was really mm -hmm. just, when I was writing it, and again, I channeled a lot of it. I don't know where those messages came from, but like, uh, it was really just a letter to myself about like, these are the things that I think I need to work on to be my best. And if I thought if I wrote about it authentically enough and I was open about it, that other people would go, hey, that sounds a lot like me. Maybe I could work on this stuff. So uh, it's great to hear you say that. You've never said that. You've complimented me quite a bit on the book in the past. Yeah. So I invited you here. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, that's, that was the whole point. And, and I think, you know, now that we've, I've lightened you guys up talking about Tiger and golf and, and the book a little bit, like how do we transfer those lessons into – we just all got smacked with an incredible challenge in the world. I feel like as a, as a humanity, we just shanked it into the woods hard. Yeah. And then how do we go in there and dig it out and find a way forward from here is the big question. Yeah. Wow. It's pretty, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. I wish someone had the answer. Honestly, I feel like right now everyone's lost and doesn't have an answer to Anything. Yeah, I think that's it is that we, you know, the lesson ultimate, the biggest lesson is that we are all in this together. We are all connected and we have to find a way forward together. And if we don't do that, we're all in trouble. I mean, I think that's really the big lesson of this thing is we got to do it together. We don't have to like each other all the time. <laughs> that's yeah. not going to happen, uh, but we can still do it together anyway. Yeah, I mean, human differences are human differences. It's it's a common goal that, you know, that that we have to figure out and, and move forward. But it's it's getting past those differences. It seems to be the people in charge is having trouble with. You know what I mean? It's the the people in charge that we that you know I've heard a, a lot of complaining lately and about the the mainstream media. And Jay, you and I have had many conversations about this. In fact. For those who don't know that haven't heard me tell it before, we did a whole one hour podcast at your place in LA before you moved to New Jersey, mostly about politics because we don't necessarily have similar political views, but we've always respected each other anyway and been able to talk about it. And obviously we need more of that. But uh, that was early on in the podcast. I corrupted all the audio and it never got <laughs> <laughs> but um, I've heard a lot of people complain about that. That's why I don't know if you guys have seen the, the new show yet, but the series I created has a character, Rich Hader, uh, with a TV show called Divide the Nation on the Not News Network. It's a parody of that. But one thing I'm not hearing a lot about is that those people are now getting sucked into the alternate of that, which is they're reading all this clickbait online, which is only manipulating them in another way for, for profit sake. And then the other one is that they're getting sucked into these conspiracy theories. And guess what? Conspiracy theorists don't play it straight either. No. They're trying to manipulate you to believe a certain thing too for their own benefit. Yeah. So like we need to learn how to tune all of that out and like do this, just talk to each yeah. other. <laughs> right. Yeah. Cause both sides are, you know, both sides are wrong. Yeah. The fact, you know, I mean, there's sides, somewhere, there's somewhere in the middle, there's truth. The and their sides is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, somewhere in the middle where it's like, okay, like, Hey, we can find this and find the betterment of, of humanity and life. And like, can we just, can we just move forward together and in the middle or what, uh, whatever, and just forward together and just go. Yeah. It's just, everybody's got their own agenda and it's just, it, talk it, about some mind of the that you faced as a player and sort of maybe we can relate that to what's going on. I don't really have that worked out. We'll see what happens, but like, you came out of college super highly touted, you know, at the same time as Tiger. 
and your career, as you said about John Daly, your playing career, you know, you didn't necessarily live up to the expectations you had or other people's had for you, other people had for you. And I know at the end, you said my book helped you sort of sort that out. But, you know, how was that to deal with when you were going through it? And what was it like to play on tour with the, I don't think a lot of people understand um, and I'm going to throw one more thing on top of this pile. Most of the guys on tour are struggling week to week or month to month. You know, the the guys that we all know are fine because they're not working. But all the lower level guys, they don't know how they're going to survive right now. And you dealt with that in a real way during your career of like grinding it out to try and feed your family. Yeah. I, honestly, man, I don't know how they're doing it. I just, I thought about that the other day and it's like, where would I be right now if I was a year, if this was last year, right. if this was 2017, where would I be? Or, you know, 2018, I don't, I don't know what I'd be doing. Yeah. Well, you probably would have uh, t called that guy back that offered you the car dealership. Yeah, probably. I mean, <laughs> but it, it just, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just so grateful to be where I'm at. and and um, But, yeah, I don't know what they're doing right now. What was it like, though, to, for those who don't know, to, like, week to week try and play for a paycheck? We, we think of athletes as spoiled guys who just get these paychecks and they don't have to do anything for it. And a lot of the major sports for the top-level guys, that's true. But what a lot of people don't realize is most, most athletes don't live like that, especially most golfers. It's week to week. Yeah. I mean, I was always weird. I always, every time I kind of got my back against the wall, I played well. I, I don't know why. It just, if you look at my career, it's like I kind of go up and then I kind of go down. And then when things got bad, I kind of went up again. I, I, that's just the way I was. It's just like, I wish I could take that attitude of, of like, you know, full desperation into playing golf constantly. And, you know, I'd be retired in the Bahamas right now if that was the case. <laughs> um, I think the, uh, the Wyndham championship's a good example of your back against the wall. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I needed to finish solo third or better to keep my card. And I finished second and only to Davis love who um, shot 65 on me in the last round or 64 on me in the last round. And, but I finished solo second to, to keep my card that year and, and, you know, out of nowhere. And it was, um, that was just one of my things. I mean, I think going into the U S open in 05, I think I had 240 bucks in my bank account, couldn't pay for anything. And next thing I know I'm in the final group of, uh, of the U S open and didn't play great that day, but all was, you know, what happened after that was crazy. So, yeah. That, that, um, that gave you a bunch of confidence because that for those who don't know you went back to the corn ferry tour i forget even what that was like four sponsors ago i don't remember nationwide, tour, yeah. nationwide. uh you won three in a row automatic promotion to the pga tour and then finally won a pga tournament yeah i you know after reading your book i kind of I, you know just looking back on my career and all that stuff i, I think i didn't like the stuff that went along with being how do I say this I was a very I'm a very quiet kind of like the two things the two things that involved in this USGA job that I absolutely hate that came along with this job was my phone and three-hour dinners <laughs> like I, I can't stand my phone I just I, I just I'm one of the I like turning in the older I get the more I turn into Fred Couples like I just, I'm just a quiet guy. Like I, I just didn't like all the the pressures and the, the, the being in public and all. I just was, it just wasn't my thing. Like I just, yeah, you know, it's, it's really I, interesting. I want to stop you there for a second because, you know, I've talked talked to a lot of people about you over the years in general as golf fans, but especially more recently because of the book. And I always tell people that you wrote it because they connect with that. And the reason they connect with that is because everybody sees you as this fun, loving, great guy. They always, almost always, Jay, they say, oh, he seems like a really great guy. And I go, sit down. Let me tell you some stories from college. No, <laughs> I don't say that. <laughs> I say, uh, I say he really is like, it's not bullshit. He's really like that. And with, you know, people really like, 
Take it easy, Tyler. There you're all right. Yeah, you saw that. <laughs> In the head of your life. Trying to fix the lighting um, for you, and I almost it, killed You know, myself. one thing you and I never talked about this that you're you're like I'm the same way. I talk about it all the time. I'm a super shy, quiet guy. I don't like to put myself out there like this. I do it because this is how I can help people, and that makes me feel good. Um, so, and I think that you've obviously got a lot of that in you too, because you don't occur that way as a quiet guy who wants to be left alone. Uh, but you are. I'm not, a, I'm not, I don't, I prefer it. Like I, I, how about this? Let me, let me put it this way. I have a saying that you'll probably laugh at and you'll totally understand, but I don't like people. I love persons. Like <laughs> if you take me to Disneyland, I'm like, totally like ah uh, like it just the, the crowds kind of like make me nervous and it, yeah. like i used to laugh at my dad when he was still around like when he did that like he he'd always say there's no such thing as fun for the whole family <laughs> right and I, I never understood what he was saying right but, <laughs> like you know, when i was a kid he'd go to disneyland and he'd just be like just this tense and like someone's gonna be miserable <laughs> yeah somebody's gonna be who's miserable it gonna, who's it gonna be <laughs> And um, I never understood that. And like the older I get, like, I mean, I love going to Disneyland or wherever, you know, hanging out with the family and kids, but like, I love hanging out with you and Tyler, like all this stuff. But like, you get me in a crowd. It's like, all of a sudden I'm like, I need a paper bag. Like I, I hyperventilate. Like it, I'm not like nervous around it. Like I'll take it and I'll, I'll go with it. But it's like, is it my choice to do? No. Yeah, well, I'm the same way, and you're way better than most of my childhood friends. Uh, shout out to Mikey, Mikey Lightning and Mike Ferrara, who often say, I hate people. So yeah. you're, not, you're not there. <laughs> so you're well, doing well. And I, I may, they're, may or may they're not. Mostly, that they're mostly full of crap, too. But I think the point is the same. It's like, you know, people are complicated and difficult to be around, especially I'm the same way as you. I don't, I don't enjoy big crowds. It's... No, I'm the same way. I, my favorite term is uh, I hate when I go in public and the public's there. Yeah. yeah. The public yeah, breaks out. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like the world's great if there weren't so many people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is a messed up joke to say now. And I don't mean that literally people yeah. out there. Uh, what I mean is that we're, here's the thing, you know, and I think that this relates to what you said about golf and your career and relates to what we're all going through. Like this is a challenging game, life. And it's made more challenging because we're all complicated and there are complicated people all around us that are dealing with their own stuff. And we're just trying to like stay above water to deal with our own personal stuff or in your case, our own fam your own family. I mean, that story you related about, about the Wyndham is great because I remember Megan, your wife saying, you know, I wish he didn't wait till the last tournament of the year. I mean, the stress of a spouse of an athlete is a whole nother level of stress. <laughs> Um, uh, but you know, this is not easy and, uh, you know, we've got to all just sort of try to do our best, which means when we're doing our best, we're giving other people a break for their flaws and faults. You know, we talked about online and people going after each other. It's like, I'm so tired of hearing, hearing pe people make fun of other people being stupid. You could, we're all stupid to a certain extent, we're human beings. Yeah. But when we go, you're stupid, does that make that person want to get better and, and, and make a better, wiser choice? No, it makes them go, well, okay, I'm stupid, but you're a jerk. Yeah. So screw you. <laughs> I mean, every, it depends on where you're standing and, you know, like how stupid you are. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, there are. You know, I mean, for sure. <laughs> I mean, do you want to talk about plate tectonics? <laughs> right. You know, like you and I are stupid, but we're standing, you know, at, at uh, Caltech and, you know, we're going to ask him about how to hit a five iron low and around the corner, you know, to, uh, skip it across the water to three feet. Now that guy's stupid. You know, the same guy that just, that just schooled us on plate tectonics. <laughs> right. You know, like, so now who's stupid? You know, it's like, well, you're you right. Act, all are. You act like I could hit a low five iron. But you could tell me how to. On, on demand. I can do it. <laughs> I just can't do it on purpose. <laughs> you can tell me how to, but but you know what I mean. I mean that's the that's the thing. It's like we're all experts in our own, you know, right? In our own frame, the frame of the world, whatever that is. And and that's my point. Is like let's share 
what we know about our through our lens of the world with other people in an encouraging way. I mean, I had a conversation with a friend yesterday who took 40 days off of Facebook from Lent. He's a, he's a guy our age, Jay, lives, at, lives by himself. And he literally posts like 20 times a day. So he took it off for Lent and then came back with a fury and put this long post about how stupid everybody is and how he's been watching this. And I, <laughs> so I called him and I'm like, dude, I'm not calling to judge you or say what you did was wrong. I just want you to know, I know you're a really good guy that cares about people. And I'm trying to encourage you to come from that place and show people that side of you because we're, as a world, whether you think this is a hoax or you think this is the end of the world or somewhere in between, which is where most of us are, um, we're gonna need to work together to get through what ha is happening. Right? Right. And the, we're going to do that a lot better when we're calling each other stupid less. <laughs> I think that's a, a big problem in the world now is, well, you guys are older, obviously. You didn't grow up with a phone in your hand or social media. I feel like so many issues. Yeah, well, lucky you. I, I did. I feel like so many issues spur from people just talking garbage about one another or something they don't know about through social media. Yeah, and... and so, uh, you know, again, with traditional media, social media, what it shows us is this very small microcosm of the world where people are so divided and so against each other. But if you go, and people are now starting to post about this that I've noticed, if you go talk to your neighbors, it's really not like that in most places. Most people are pretty reasonable and just want to live happy lives and be cool with each other. Um, so we have to, you know, unplug from this stuff that's telling us that things are so bad and that the world's ending and that those people are the problem. I mean, one of the things that's so crazy to me that people don't get, I see people all the time, and I'm not saying I'm outside of this. I do it too. We all do it. Those people, if they, if they were just, you know, this way or they were just that way or the extreme version of that starts to go, why don't we get rid of those dumb Democrats or those, un, uh, you know, those insensitive Republicans? Like, Wait, what are you talking about? The extreme version of that is genocide. We don't just take people out of the equation and then everything gets better. It doesn't work that way. We have to talk to each other. <laughs> I mean, and, and the unfortunate part is that's all we got right now. You know what I mean? I mean, that's all we got is these, these, these machines and these things. And, and well, like we the people are not taking control. <clears throat> One thing I've started to say recently is, you know, people complain about media. All right, stop watching. It's easy for me to say I made that decision six almost seven years ago now and it was a tough decision because I had to say I'm going to be a little bit under informed but I'm going to be a lot happier of a person watching news makes me angry or sad almost all the time because that's yeah. all it's showing us that's all it sells I've never seen anything on the news about something good it's always the negative stuff it sells I've never ever watched the news like I just have no desire because all it is is negativity and Anytime you talk about politics, if someone doesn't like your opinion, they actually don't like you. I just think that's ridiculous not to like someone over their opinion on something. So, so let me ask you this, Tyler, or both of you guys. Well, maybe, maybe more Z, but um, was it like that when we were young? Did, yeah. When we just stopped watching the news, or is it like that now? It's like, dude, do, you, do we hit like a certain age where it's like, well, maybe we're like, supposed Maybe. to watch the news and it turns into almost like a reality tv show that's exactly well is that's you know uh, how we ended up with the president that we had and i'm not saying anything good or bad or, about him i've never liked him personally but i also think that as an american it's my responsibility to support the president of the united states even if i don't particularly like him um so that's just an aside, but like, yeah, it was that bad, but we weren't disconnected. So we didn't know it, right? There were, there were those factions. I know because my dad was always one. He's always seen politics as like a sport. He likes to watch the TV and yell at the other team. Right. But for him, a, he, can, he can separate those things because it doesn't allow it to turn him into a different person. We've now gone well beyond that. And I try to encourage him whenever I can to stop doing that because it's not good for any of us right. to do that. But I Tyler, just, I'd love to hear your version on that. Not like, what was it like, obviously, when you were younger, but what do you see in that whole conversation? Like, like I said, like, I'm not really big into politics, mainly because 
A, I'm really just not interested. I just think whoever is running the show, I always have thought like that doesn't matter. They're kind of always going to just try and take their money from taxes and stuff. Doesn't matter who's in office. But um, just also, like I said, the negativity on social media. Like if you don't have the same opinion as me, they try and belittle me, you know? I don't want someone to dislike me because, oh, you voted for so-and-so or this or that. So that's why I really just keep to myself but I just think social media is such a huge platform when it comes to politics and just the way people act on there. I just try and stay away from it. And it's the same with the news. Everything is literally just negativity on the news, regardless of what side you're on. About five or six years ago, I scrubbed my entire history of my Facebook profile to take anything political off of it. I, yeah. And I made it a firm rule. And sometimes I want to engage and say something, but I won't. I will not discuss politics on, on social media. My, my metaphor that I use for it is it's like going to an all-you-can-eat buffet with no money in your pocket and just watching people gorge on food. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's completely frustrating and unfulfilling. And you don't get anything out of it except pain. <laughs> yeah. yeah i have like i have a couple friends that like retweet stuff and talk about stuff and i know there's other people literally will judge them over that like i don't even try and swear on social media let alone post politics because you really never know who's watching and you don't want them to form an opinion over something so stupid yeah what's something that that tyler you've played golf since you were a little kid right Mm, yeah, probably like I started really playing when I was probably like six. I don't remember anything prior to that. So, yeah. So um, what's something that I mean, because, you know, we've seen the first tee and pro kids. I, I've worked with them, the founding chapter, mm -hmm. in Diego. Basically. That really that really I don't really think sorry to cut you off. I don't really think the first tee was like that big when I was six. Like I think it's grown over the last for sure 10 years. But when I was like six, they didn't really have like those, you know, golf leagues and stuff. Right. But what I wanted to get to, I didn't know if you were involved in that or not, but you've gotten, mm -hmm. you've gotten the lessons for golf and like how to be a level headed, good person, uh, yeah. respectful, do the right thing, have integrity, you know, all the things that those programs teach. So how did it teach you those tools that you have that maybe a lot of your peers may or may not have because they chose different paths or played different sports yeah i mean i'm still working on those unfortunately i was the hothead when i grew up which i mean wasn't good but i've gotten better with it but like golf and life like jason said it's a microcosm really um i've just learned so let's like, talk specifically about the hothead part because i know that that's one that you oh. work on. something jay and i still work on everybody sees us as these nice <laughs> calm fun loving guys and that's true mostly but not all the yeah time for sure <laughs> i feel like really and you talk about this in the book was it when for me when it became being a hothead it was trying to be perfect like if i'm sitting in the middle of a fairway and have an eight iron and if i hit it to 35 feet i get aggravated like why can't you hit it to 10 feet you suck like what's wrong with you and then that leads to me maybe missing the next putt, getting more pissed off, and just keep going. I was going just going to say, like, how does that make you? How does that thought make you play better? You suck. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm that's saying. It. So I've been working on that. So that's the really way. Where... I still am too, just because I wrote this book. I I just I'm one of the lucky ones because I'm in Florida and the golf courses are still open and we can still play safely and keep a distance from mm -hmm. here. Um, I just made double from the fairway uh, last week and. It really didn't make me feel too good. And I had to go through the process of like, okay, that hole happened. It's already done. Uh, beating yourself up here isn't going to make things better. So let's just find a way to move forward. <laughs> yeah. Um, so like I said, I'm still working on that, but I've gotten better. I don't know how it just like clicked overnight this year. I'm just like, if I hit a bad shot, like, okay, let's go find it and hit again as someone quotes that. That's something Jason said forever. Yeah. Oh, I just hit it. I stole that and into put it the... in the book. And I, yeah. I got it from someone else. Who get, who gave you that one? I don't know. It's, you know it is a great um, – look, It's I reason I repeat it in the book is it's such a great simplicity of the game of golf. That's really what it is. And, and again, also... 
taking that simplified approach to life is I think a really important thing to just simplify and uh, we can complicate things so much, but why not just go, okay, this is what's happening now. This is what I do now. Okay, I did that. Now what do I do? <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, also you said like translating to life with being a hothead, like it's the same thing in, in life. Oh, you made a mistake. Oh, you got a bad grade on this test or oh, this didn't work out in your job instead of getting mad and holding it on to the next thing, just get over it and just keep moving. Honestly, find, find something else that you can work on and just keep moving. Yeah. Jay, you wanted to say something. Oh no, I just think like uh, going into that, I think I was able to start to accept hitting poor shots, like, you know, hitting an eight iron to, to like just using Tyler's example to 35 feet, even though right now I would, I would totally take that. Um, <laughs> I think what what I started to work on was the process of hitting into it. Cause you know, once the, once the golf ball left the club face and just like anything in life, once the decision is made and the trigger is pulled, right. Um, you may as well have bought a ticket. And, and you know, once the golf ball leave the club face, if I can look back and say, you know what? I did everything right. I, I committed to what I was trying to do. And I just didn't pull it off. Okay. You know, like I, I can accept that. It's like, all right, I'm a human. It's, it's a game. I'm, I'm, a, I'm making a, a round golf ball outside with a round golf swing as a human being trying to make it go straight. The whole physics of it should be impossible. Okay. So what I'm trying to do is just be so prepared to make the correct decision and do the correct thing that if it doesn't come off, so be it. I was prepared. I did my best. Um, and that's the same thing. Like even now in, in my real job, it's like, all right, well, I got to take in all of my aspects, all of my considerations, everything I do to try to make the proper decision. And then, you know what, if, it, if it's the wrong decision, then you know what, at least I had all the facts and all the info that we, you know, that we needed. And, and um, you know, so be it. And that, I think that's, that's where you can try to, Tyler, like try to find peace in, in the process or, or in the results because it's really not about the results is you can only do so much. You might get a gust of wind. You might get, there might be mud on your ball. There might be, you know, some sort of goofy factor that, that you have that, that, that happens outside of your control, right? You know, you've wrong yardage. You may have, you know, you may have lasered the tree over the green. And you, blow it over the green. You, know, you, may have hit, you may have hit it too good. Yeah, you may have hit it too good, you know, it, it, it's whatever. Like you may have caught a fly. There are so many different, you know. Well, it's a great matters. it's a great concept. And as you know, there's a whole chapter in the book about that, about the brief moment of impact is the only part you control. Well, and everything up to that, like you just said. Once you make impact, it's a, it's out of your hands. And then the concept in the book is just what we what you just talked about. It's releasing attachment to the outcome. Yeah. You've done everything that you can. And like you said, now you bought a ticket. You get to, and actually, you can make this into a really positive, cool thing. Now I did everything I could. Now I get to watch and see what happens. Ah, yeah. oh, it didn't go the way I wanted. That stinks. All right, let me try it again. <laughs> sometimes you get lucky and it goes the other way. You know, right. sometimes you hit the sometimes you don't hit it well and it just works out amazing. Or how many putts you hit that you're like, oh my gosh, that's perfect and it misses. And how many putts do you like, I pulled it out? Yeah, I put it onto the right line because I misread it. <laughs> I just read the heck out of that thing and it went right in the middle. But uh, yeah. I, I, before, like you said, the moment of impact. Before that, I feel like in the book talks about this as well. Before we even get to the moment of impact, some of the biggest things, also in life, not even golf, is just like, yep, exactly, is the confidence and keeping your thoughts in check. That's in the book. Like, yeah. clear me, your like, so that you can, prepare. yeah. Mm -hmm. Like but back to the, the eight iron to 35 feet. I have so many thoughts going through my head of, oh, what if I do this? What if I do that? Like, just pick it and, okay, I hit it. If it doesn't work out, oh, well. That's just hard. It's, it's easy to say now until you're actually in front of it about to do it, though. Yeah. Jay, I want to talk about, like, you, you said something to me, and I'm going to paraphrase, but 
um, when you read the book and then wrote and then immediately sat down and wrote the foreword because you were so inspired, which was such a, a great blessing to me and a real compliment. But you said, you know, like I talked about, you had struggled your own your whole career with your own expectations and outside expectations of what you think you should have done with your career as opposed to what really happened in your career. And you said that the book helped you put that in perspective to think like, you know what, if eventually I have, I'm going to stop playing golf professionally at some point, I have to. It's not something you can do for eternity. <laughs> we haven't figured that out yet. Um, and you said, you know, I realized that, that it's okay if I play golf or I don't play golf for, yeah. as a profession. Yeah. I mean, I think the things that I used in your book were when I got to that, like, turnstile of life i think for lack of a better i don't know I'm looking for an analogy a clever analogy and couldn't come up with one <laughs> it's but, early um, it's early we'll give you it's a early yeah the, the coffee's only quarter drank but um <laughs> i wasn't afraid to make that decision yeah. you know i mean do i do i still think i have some good golf in me yeah yeah i mean like i i do i mean i might still have some in me at 50 who knows like but right now at 40 it's almost 46 years old i, I just I was done. It wasn't there for me anymore. It just, the, the desire to, to, to do it wasn't there. And, and I never played golf for money. I played because I love the game. And, and I never, it just, it was, it was a bonus for what happened. I played for trophies. I played for the, I played because I wanted to kick your butt. Serious question. And I'm not trying to mess with your head. Does it still bother you that you didn't win more? Oh yeah, of course. It bothers Tiger that he didn't win more. I would you know what I mean? It, it bothers it bothers everybody. Like, yeah, I, that's sort of what I'm getting to. Is like we all feel that any competitor, life, right? Yeah. Like, I wish I had done more things, but you can't go back. So how yeah. do you how do you deal with that? I mean, did you did you uh, see the the recent thing on uh, Arnold Palmer? I just watched on Golf Channel the other day. They said if you could go back and win anything, it was like. He's like, well, what would you want to win? He goes, the PGA Championship. Like, immediately. Like, and this is Arnold Palmer, right? right. Like, you know, like, arguably the guy that, that changed golf forever. And, yep. and like, yeah, you, you talk to anybody. You can talk to, to anybody in business. And, and would, they, would they want to do something different? Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, do I, do I wish I would have won more? Do I – I wish I would have won more because I loved winning. Yeah. The feeling, right? You know what I mean? It's that feeling of like I like, did it. I yeah, like in the challenge. Yeah, it was it was just that that feeling of like, all right, that was worth it. Yeah, I'm you know, sure I cried when you finally won on the PGA tour because I as a friend I had watched your journey for so long and I knew how much it meant to you. It was easy to see on your face. And any week you watch the PGA tour, you see this look from whoever wins, whether they've won a hundred times or this is the first one, you're like, oh my God, I actually did it. <laughs> you know, and, and, and it, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. Like, I wish it didn't mean that much to me. Mm -hmm. I wish it, I wish it didn't, wish it just like, all right, cool, what's next? Yeah, but then that, like, that, that could have led to a lot more. And, you know, who knows? I mean, but it, there's a way to look at it. I, I wouldn't it, trade it, but. Yeah, but also like, it wouldn't mean as much to you if it, if it, well, I don't know how to say it because I'm saying the same thing, but like it means so much because it's so challenging. Right. If, and, if it was easy, it wouldn't mean that much. And, it, and then you would be like, Oh, okay. I did that. But like to win on that tour, I mean, to win your weekend game for a hacker like me <laughs> or a much better hacker like Ty, uh, Tyler, who's not a hacker at all, by the way. <laughs> um, really good, actually. You know, that means a lot just in those brief moments for us mortals who can't play at that level. Like, oh, I beat this person based on our handicap system. <laughs> like, that feels really good because it's not an easy game. Right. I mean, like, I'll go up and tell my buddy Casey that, you know, at Lakeside Golf Club back in California, they're on, they have the club championship and it's, they have these boards up on the wall. And every year, and I'm like, go immortalize yourself. Well, they'll put your name on the board when you win the club championship. And then, they, you know, somewhere on tour, it's like, you know, you become immortal. Like, you, you, you're a tour winner. And 
I don't know how like immortal that is. You know, it's like, I just saw Doug Sanders died this morning, but like, that was sad thing. But, um, you know, it's like, there's a way to like, he's immortalized because he's, 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 he's a tour. It's, like I think to what you're trying to say, cause I know you, I, it's not immortal cause none of us are immortal, but it's a way to be remembered that in this lifetime, in this body, I did yes. something pretty cool that day. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, it, it's, it's, well, what, what do they say? When there, there's there's two times you die when they put your body in the ground, and then the last time your your name's ever not spoken. Right. You know what I mean? It's like all right. But, you know what? This is why I'm doing this. What I do, not to be immortalized, but I had years ago uh, when I was in my mid thirties and in the music business and partying and living the fast life. I had a good friend and business partner of mine sort of pull me aside and go, "Well, you know, you don't have a family, which is not a big deal, but like." ever think about your legacy? And I immediately answered, no. <laughs> and then around then, I was about 35. Like I said, I thought, well, maybe I should start thinking about that. I, so the way I looked at it was like the first half of my life was really fun. I got a lot of experience. It just gave me a lot to talk about. And now I'm using sort of the last half of my life to share those experience and thoughts with people so that I can help. And that will be my legacy so that I know that I did something that mattered while I was here in this body. Right. And that's really what we're talking about. Right. And it all goes back to, you know, and there's all those judgments about, well, maybe I should have done more. Well, I can't do more then I can do more now. <laughs> well, that, that, and that's, that's kind of like why I took this job with, with the USJ. We said, I, I, I said, I wouldn't talk about the USJ, but here we go. Um, <laughs> what is your exact title? Cause I don't think I know it. Senior Director of Player Relations. So when I, when I, from the moment I picked up a golf club, all I ever wanted to do was make a difference in the game. I wanted, the day I, gosh, I'm talking a lot about dying right now. This is weird, but um, maybe it's just because of what was going on in the world. But um, the moment I leave this earth, I just wanted to be, I wanted them to say that guy made a difference in the game. And maybe I made a difference for, you know, 10 to 15 seconds with my golf clubs. Um, but I felt like I could make a difference being here in this organization, doing what I'm doing for a lot longer. And, and I think that's why when I was given this, when I was brought forward with this opportunity, I'm like, you know what? I can make a difference. I can, looking back on my, on my legacy, they can be like, wow, when that guy came aboard, he really made a difference. And I think that's why I was willing to be like, all right, you know, maybe, maybe this path led me to being here. Maybe all this knowledge and experience led me to being here, what I'm doing. And, you know, sometimes you just don't ask questions. Sometimes you just go, you know, maybe golf administration was up what I was supposed to do. And, you know, yeah, like I, I had a, I had a, a nice career. It was great. Like I loved it. Maybe in three and a half, four years, I might look at doing something else, but for right now, it's like if I can make a difference in no matter what you're doing for the game of golf, the game of golf we all love and do it while I'm here and do the best job I can, then you know what? I can maybe hopefully someday they'll look back and be like, yeah, that guy made a difference. That well, was you're, you're uniquely positioned for that as well, because you are this, fun lively guy that everybody connects to and I'm not going to talk poorly about your current employer because I don't want to get you in trouble but let's just say that over the last few years they've had some issues with the way they're perceived by the public that's uh, what I was going that's what I was going to say last year was your first open at Pebble right like quote unquote helping out and setting up the course I really didn't hear any bad comments about the US Open last year previous years it was pretty noted that they did this wrong they did that wrong you know and they made questionable decisions during tournaments that didn't have the best look you know that all that type of stuff matters for their brains and to have a guy like you on board that everybody relates to especially the players because you're friends with all those guys for real it's not like a fake thing that's a real thing and to also you connect so well with the greater public and that's been one of their biggest issues. So to have that brought in house is a big thing. I, I, I think now that I'm here and I see 
I see how much everybody inside the building loves golf. And I think it was just kind of like, they've been picked on so badly. Like I'm not afraid to stick up for like, you know, there's been a couple of things with, with the U S senior open canceling. And, and you know, it's like, unfortunately we're dealing with life or death situations right now. And it's, 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 it's scary. And there's, there's, you know, there's certain things where we're just handcuffed and, you know, it's situations and time wise and, you know, clubs and, it's a, yeah, it's a tough um, thing to balance because people yeah, want to it, go it, back to some feeling of normalcy. I mean, yeah, um, and, and but, but we have to be very careful with that. And I've been on the phone with some people that were not happy, and they were at the end of the conversations. It was like, just thanks for reaching out. You yeah. know, thanks for like, okay, I, I get it now. Thanks for like, you know, nobody's making rash decisions and nobody's making these. I think that's an important point of what's going on in the world in general right now. That yeah. The more we reach out to each other, instead of like judging from a distance, whether it's about a golf tournament decision or it's a judgment about something somebody said on social media, like I shared about my story yesterday, the more we reach out to that person and go, you know what? I actually care. I just want to talk to you about like, is, how are you doing? What's, is everything okay? Yeah. And then talk about whatever else you have to talk about after that. Like that makes a big difference. Yeah. That people don't give a shit. Yeah. And I've been yelled at and I've been like, all right, are you done? Are you done yelling? Cause it's my turn now. You know, like, okay. Like, listen, I'm going to, like, I told my boss the other day, I'm like, I do some of my best work after I say, are you done yelling at me yet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, you know, and then get to the point of like, Hey, listen, this, this is what was involved in the decision. You may not like it, but we're certainly not going to make an error. This is life or death stuff, and we're not going to err. I on think things. what it's important to realize is that the way to err right now is to be too careful, not to be not careful enough. That's well, I, Mike. Mike Wan said it perfectly. He goes, you know, I can't. I'm not a. I'm going to plagiarize what he said, but he's like, you know what? If I make the wrong decision on erring on the good side, I can live with it. If I, you know, if if I if I don't, if I make the wrong decision on erring on the side of like playing and people get sick, well then I don't know if I can sleep at night. That's, and I'm playing. that's my personal goal. I've been I've oftentimes been accused by outside people and by myself of being too nice in certain situations. And I say all the time, I'm always gonna miss on that side. Yeah. I'm not gonna miss by being too much of a jerk. That's not gonna happen. And not that that doesn't happen. I'm a human being. Sometimes I do because I react without thinking. Yeah. Um, but really, my goal is to always err on the side of being too nice. Yeah. Uh, you know, I watched this really cool Dave Chappelle uh, thing on Netflix. It was a, he got this Kennedy Center Award, the Mark Twain Award for being a comedian. And he said, spoke to, there was a clip of him speaking to his high school, which was an art school in D.C., and he said, I would give you the advice that I wanted, needed to hear when I was your age. And it's very simple, amazing advice. And it was, be kind and don't be scared. And, and I would say, like, maybe you, there's a little nuance with the don't be scared part. Like, you're going to be scared because this is life and it's scary sometimes. But move past the fear. Right. Don't let the fear stop you. Like in a golf tournament, right? Like, You've got a shot to hit and it's super scary. There's a lot on the line, but being in that fear is not going to help you hit that shot as well as you can. But all right, let's, let's go into that. This is, this yeah. is great because <laughs> I'm playing in my, I might've been an amateur at the time and Bob Burns, who was a great player, buddy of mine, who grew up in Valencia one in Disney one year and we were playing Long Beach open and he had like a six footer in the greens were let's just say they were decent. Okay. They were not great. Right? Okay. That's very kind he had of a six footer downhill left to right to win. And he made it. And I, I mean, I would struggle with my putting. They were bouncing all over the place. And I go dude, what were you thinking about over that putt? He goes, well, there's only two things that can happen. Either I was going to make it or I was going to miss it. It was like, wow. Yeah. That's the way to handle fear. Because what's, what's actually going to happen? Right. I think that that's, look, there's a, as a person who I've been open about being very shy, I don't like putting myself out there. 
I've had to overcome a lot of fear of doing that. And, and part of that is just what you said. What's the worst that's going to happen? People are going to yeah. judge me poorly. Okay, I can't control how they judge me. What I can control is how I deliver messages and how I you know, do the things that I do to try and do my best to say the things that I hope that help, I hope might resonate with people. It's up to them from there. And, and honestly, like, that's, that's either going to hit or miss with them. Right. <laughs> and, and honestly, there's like, especially in golf, like in, with my profession, and, and I started to realize there was only like 10 people that actually cared. You know, it was like my mom, my manager, my caddy, my wife, my, my kids didn't even really, they were too young. They, they didn't really you, Tyler, and a couple, you know, my, my buddy Casey, there was like a couple people that actually cared. You know, if I made like a six footer to win or something like that, nobody else cared. Yeah. You know, everybody else was hoping I'd miss it. And then that, <laughs> well, well, I don't know about that. Well, you know what I mean. But they I mean, were going like, to go on with their life. They were going to go on with their life yeah. either way. Yes. And, and that's, that's it. my dad had a license plate growing up. And I thought it, this is another thing. Like he was a, he great, he gave great like lessons that I never even realized, but it was, his license plate was all but six. And it was, it was this to everybody in the world, except for the six people that are in a carrier casket. And I didn't realize. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you meant it was about your family, but I didn't think. No, no, no. All but you. six. It was just like, you know, <laughs> Screw everybody in the world except for the, all the, all but six people are going to carry your casket because those are going to be the real friends in your life. And you know, it's like, you just realize you're like, hmm. I have a great uh, personal story that relates to you and Tyler with this. So uh, last, well, two winters ago, and it was the winter of 2018, November, I was coming down here to Florida to spend a few months and work down here and write and start the podcast and all that stuff. And I had driven in two days from Boston to Sarasota. So I was beat because we're not young anymore. And that's a tough ride at our age. Um, and you happen to be that next day, we're going to tee off in the final group at the RSM up in Georgia. Sea Isle, Georgia, right? Yep. Sea Isle, yep. So I got my ass back in the car and drove six, six and a half hours straight to see you, and again, this is one of those things where you know I'm a fan and I'm rooting for you, but I also had a personal rooting interest. This guy's written, he's a close friend, he's written the forward of my book. This could also be really beneficial to me if he pulls this off. Either way, I want you to win, but you know, being honest, I see the world through my framework, so that was in running in the back of my head too. So I'm like, I'm going because there's a lot on the line for everybody involved. I get there, I get I get there just in time to get to the putting green to see you being carted away to the first tee. I'm like, shoot, I missed him, but all right, I'll catch him on the course. Next thing I know, Rich Lerner's standing right there. I go, hey, Rich, I wanted to give you a copy of a book I wrote. I give him the little pitch, sign it for him. Jason Gore wrote the forward to this? Yeah. Are you his mental coach? Rich, I, I wouldn't say that. Uh, we're friends. He likes what's in the book. We've talked about it. I know it's helped him talked about your expectations and there's a whole chapter about that and how you at the end of your career you were able to let go of your past expectations and just play so he's like this is great I'm gonna talk about this on air today I'm like really okay <laughs> this is great I go I go out there I catch you on the first tee you got uh, a funky little lie off the fairway I think you clipped a tree or something you leave yourself like 60 feet short of the pin off the green chip in for birdie and I'm like oh my god <laughs> here we go this might happen and then you know uh, for those who are familiar with the story the rest of it you just couldn't get it going that day just didn't have it you played well but couldn't make anything couldn't hit it close enough couldn't make any putts and, uh, you know, so for me personally, there was a, a double sad feeling, right? There was this great opportunity for me personally. There was this amazing opportunity, which I saw was much bigger for you to win again, sort of put that extra stamp you really wanted on, on your career. Um, but, you know, uh, the way I dealt with that was to go, you know what? It wasn't the right time for either of us, obviously, because it didn't happen. 
Rich Lerner didn't talk about my book live on the broadcast. Jason didn't get his second win with a giant gap between them. Your buddy did, which was kind of cool to see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not as cool as, as, you, as you winning. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, it was just a personal story about what we were just talking about. Of like, Yeah, the, so we both missed that day. We both well, tried our best. And we both missed that day. It wasn't for a lack of effort. I mean, no, no. And, and I feel like, you know, and that was the thing too of driving home was like, I know for this book that this is going to sell a million copies one day. Right now, it's still only sold a few thousand. I know it's a good enough book, but I'm, I'm just waiting for the time when that's right, when that happens. Right? Yep. Who knows? Like you said, you may go back and play again and win again one day. Who knows? Yep. Uh, but I just thought that that was something I thought about thinking about. This was like a fun story of like how our stories intertwined in the philosophy that's in the book and the things we talk about and our, and our friendship and your family. Uh, you know, there's so many layers to that, but really it's just the thing like you were either going to win the tournament that day or not win the tournament that day. Yeah, it's, yeah it wasn't the right time, but you know, it will and happen. Oh, I Something. can tell by the look on your face that it still gets under your skin that you didn't win the tournament that well, day. Well, anytime, you know, anytime yeah. you put yourself in that We position. have a chance and you don't do it, it's a bummer. And especially like that day, like, okay, like the last round of the US Open, I played terrible. Yeah. RSM, I didn't. I, I hit oh. a bunch of, I, I played fine. I played good enough to win. It's just the putts that, <laughs> that found the bottom of the hole, dodged the front edge and, you know, it's just, it's golf. Like it's just, that one, that one was painful because, you know, it, it, who knows that, you know, that, see, the thing is, is I go out even right now and I go watch these guys hit balls and I'm like, yeah, I'm still better than you. <laughs> well, that you know? was, see, that was the thing with you is you were always top 10 or 20 in the world in ball striking. Yeah. If you watched like just the, the, the God-given talent that you have to hit a golf ball is unbelievable to watch. I wish I could yeah. do that one time, hit one ball like that. <laughs> if, uh, if your putting putt at the back end of your career would have been there at the beginning, you know, I would have felt bad who played you, except for Tiger. He still probably would have got you, but everyone else. <laughs> yeah. But that's the thing is, like, that's how thin the margins are on that tour. Yeah. Well, there are so many like, guys on that tour that are amazing ball strikers, and it all comes down to like who's going to make putts that weekend and then that Sunday. Well, and I came out at such an odd time. Like when I came out at 23 years old, like I wasn't supposed to be good. You know, like if you look at it, when I came out, it was like the 35 year olds that were really good. It was the Curtis Stranges, it was the, you know, or whoever was out there at that time. But like it was when I was 23, 24 years old. It's like, listen, kid, you're going to take your lumps and you're going to get, you're going to have your time. And then it's like all of a sudden I became 35 and this like the ages started to get younger and younger. Yeah. Mr. Woods. Um, <laughs> right. And, um, you know, and it's like all of a sudden I just started like, it's like my window for opportunity. And I'm not, I'm not making excuses. Believe me, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not, but it's like all of a sudden I got to, to 35 or 36 and I was like, wow, everybody's 24 now. Yeah. And, you know, it's like all of a sudden it's like, I mean, for, for how long I stayed out there, I mean, I just saw buddies of mine that were the same age just fall by the wayside, like quickly. I mean, I stayed out there for, for the buddies that I hung out with. I mean, they were all gone way before I was, you know, most of them. But, um, you know, so, I mean, I kind of take either I'm just way too, like, hard-headed not to leave earlier or or just, you know, but... Or, you know, I, I had a nice long career, but, um, you know, it, it was just one of those things. It's like the 45, now that I'm 45, and if you're not a stud by the time you're 26, well, you, you're, you're old, you know, and that's all, that's all. This is the tiger, you know, hangover or phenomenon that's coming up that, you know, kids Tyler age, Tyler's age that they're like, they don't have the fear. They don't have the scars. They don't have the three footers that they, they missed to, to right. miss in school. It's in like, that case, ignorance is bliss. They have zero fear. They, and you know, they're, they're younger, stronger, faster, and they have the experience. They have the experience that, that we didn't, 
know we have at 26 years old. And then, you know, they have the training, they have the, you know, the mental coaches, the, the, the physical attributes and, and they're, you know, like I said, they're bigger, stronger, faster, but I'm not, like I said, I'm not making excuses. I'm just, I'm just saying the facts, but um, yeah. you know, it's just, uh, you know, they, it, they're just, they're just better younger now. And yeah, I, yeah well, I, you're right. I mean, there's no, there isn't an excuse. It's just a statement of what happened during your career. Yeah. It's just, they're, they're just better younger. And you know, it's like a good old guy will always be, I mean, a good young guy will always be the, a good old guy. And it's just like, you know, it's, it's like a good big guy will always be the good little guy. You know, it's just in football. It's, it's just, you know, it's just, that's just the way it is. And, yeah. you know, it's like, I, I think when, I think that's why I get so excited when I think, you know, maybe if I, depending on how things go now, you know, if I'm 50, guess what? Guess what? I'm, I'm a kid again. When yeah. I'm 50. And I'm, you know, I've got, I've got, I've got dumbbells by the, by the, by the uh, desk right here. So when I'm sitting here and I'm on, you know, I'm on non video zoom calls, I'm doing, I'm lifting, I'm, I'm doing stuff. I got a Peloton. I'm riding every day. You know, I'm trying to ride every day. And I would imagine your back could use a few years off. Yes, it could. Um, you know, the grind that you put it through. Yeah, for but something years. <laughs> but I, but I want it to be by choice, not by lockdown. Yeah. You know? no, look, I've had, you know, I'm the same age as you and I've, had similar things like uh, obviously on a different level just as a, a regular guy playing golf in the fall I couldn't play I got sciatica for the first time I oh. stopped playing for three months I couldn't play it's, and then I got down here and I went out and played and then my back uh, the next day my back locked up and I'm like oh my god I'm in Florida and the golf courses are still opening and you're telling me because of my back I'm not going to be able to play so lucky that I stretched and it it released and I'm able to do it. But yeah, I mean, that's a whole other thing. The physical toll that a game like that takes as far, especially at an elite level. Yeah. yeah. Well, we saw that. I think you were there Z first hand. The last time we were in DC, that happened to remember that Jay, no, you're yeah. back. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, he was fine until what you slipped in the bunker and it yep. just locked up from there. This is literally the same thing you were just talking about with your back. Yeah, and it is. I mean, obviously, it's not the same thing because I wasn't playing in a professional tournament, but it yeah. can happen that quickly where all of a sudden, physically, you just can't do it. I mean, even going back to Tiger, watching the rebroadcast yesterday, when he got up to start, he got up at 3.45 in the morning to start preparing his body for that final round. What time did he tee off? Noon? One o'clock? Something probably, like probably that? Like 1.30. Probably 1.30. But in 10, 11 hours of physical and mental work to prepare himself for that. Yeah. That's I, <laughs> I texted with him on Tuesday after that. And I'm like, man, I'm just, I'm so proud of you. And he's like, I am in so much pain. I'm like, you just go take care of yourself. <laughs> I mean, it just, um, man. I'm it, no it's, I mean, what he puts himself through is it's incredible. I mean, he just, he's, it just shows you the want and desire and the, the the level of desire is what always set him apart. Yeah. And not that he wants it more than, than anybody else, but he's so willing to just go there and do whatever it takes. And, and you would think like after 15 majors and, you know, 81 tour victories. And I mean, when we talked the other day, we talked about his golf swing. Like he's talking about like, I mean, his mind is constantly working <laughs> on how to get better. And it's like, dude, relax. He's literally got a mental illness to be that. No, no, and, and thank God for it because yeah. I love watching his mental illness. Yeah. We all do. You know I mean? It's like he constantly, it's all he wanted to talk about. He wants to talk about golf, golf, golf. And then, you it's know, like it's like Tom Brady, you know, as a big Pats fan, that guy's got a mental illness of desire of, proving people wrong and wanting to be the best. It's the only way you can be that good. Yeah. That's how Jordan got there. That's how Bird got there. Yep. And just this, uh, this inner desire to just want to end you. Like, on, on, yeah. On, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like a, a metaphorical, I want to kill you metaphorically. Yeah, yeah not, yeah, just, just <laughs> embarrass you. Like, just put your foot on the, on the jugular and just end you, embarrass you. Ty, well, we're, we've gone quite a bit longer than I thought we would, so we'll start wrapping up. But Ty, before we do, I wanted you to talk a little bit about like what's going on in your world. You've just 
graduated college or about to start work as yeah. a health professional, you got a job, and now you're sitting mm-hmm. on the sidelines waiting. How's that? I mean? know. Boring. Very, very boring because I finished school in December. So then I uh, got this job at Hartford Golf Club. Very fortunate for that. And I was supposed to start like February, April, and then obviously all of this hits. So it's on the back burner until who knows when, you know, just looking forward to starting the career in golf. Cause obviously it's uh, very hard to play this game competitively. You know, everyone's, there's so many kids trying to play at my age, just trying to become what Jason pretty much did, just play golf on tour for 20 years. Who wouldn't want to do that? So doing that's very tough. So, I decided to uh, try and just teach. If I can't be good enough for myself, I might as well try and help others become better at the game. Yeah, well, it's noble. And also you learned because you became friends with Jason, which again speaks to his character. Here's a young kid fan that he takes in and becomes almost part of his family and you guys become friends. But Mm -hmm. you got to see inside the ropes. You know, uh, I always thought I wanted to be, if I could pick one thing, I'd want to be a professional golfer. And then I saw what it took for Jay to have to do it. And I'm like, oh my God, the pressure and the the physical toll and the mental toll is just grueling. So for you to get that education of like, hey, maybe this isn't, uh, you know, this glorious career. Sure it is if you're in one of the top five, 10% and you're not sweating out money and you can pick your tournaments. That's great. Most of the guys aren't doing that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love playing the game. I have no problem going and working out just to try and get my body better for golf. And you're young. I love that. It's just, it's just, as Jace says, it's very hard. I mean, and you don't know where near as talented as those guys. You might Monday qualify on something and have a great finish, and then your life and your career goes in a different mm-hmm. way. That's the thing. Like you said, it, uh, it only takes really one event to change your life. It's just getting there, working, 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 and just hopefully it happens. So but that, if it doesn't happen, then we'll just teach people how to play golf instead. I'll get back and try and help. It's talking about like you're sitting on the sidelines. We all are in the world. Yeah. Everybody's dealing with challenges now, physical, financial, mental whatever. Um, uh, So how do we use that time positively to mentally prepare ourselves for when they take the cuffs off us and we get to go back to whatever the new normal is? Uh, You know, there's a little bit in the book, I talk about visualization for people that live in cold climates in the winter, you can visualize playing golf and it will actually help you become a better player. But Mm -hmm. we're in life, we can visualize the things that we want in life that we don't currently have right now. And then once again, when the handcuffs are taken off, we'll be in a better position to have those things. So how do we meditate and visualize and think about the things that we want in a productive way, not lamenting like, oh, I wish I was there right now. But hey, how can I use this time to prepare myself to be a better golf teacher, to be a better player liaison? to be a better speaker communicator, right? That's why I'm doing these Zoom things. I lost all the live speaking gigs I had for the rest of the year, just poof. And for me, you guys know that's how I fund this whole yeah. thing. That's the best way to fund it for me. So I had to rework of like, okay, that happened. That was my shank into the woods professionally. How am I gonna chop it out? Okay, Zoom's a great technology. I can do podcasts. I can do, I'm just starting up after we hang up, I'm going to launch a GoFundMe where I'm uh, putting out there to people to do free Zoom talks like this, not podcasts, but for uh, for, uh, frontline workers, healthcare workers, grocery store clerks, truckers, because everybody's dealing with something difficult right now. So I just want to talk to people and help them through it. For kids, for families that are stuck together, like Jay, you know how hard it is when you're piled on top of each other all the time. That's a difficult thing. And if I can be an outside force to bring some levity and some fun and some perspective to that, you know, that's what I want to do. So I'm launching a GoFundMe so that I can do this stuff for people for free who need a little mental help right now. And I'm not a therapist, but you guys know, you've read my book, you've heard me just talk. When I talk, people generally get something out of it. So that's the way I can help the world right now. And it just so happens 
that can also help my career in the long run because now I can do this and I can do 15, 20 schools a week where five weeks ago when I had to be live in person, I could never do that. That's too much. But now I might actually be able to help more people. So, you know, that's sort of the conversation that I want to bring. And I want to bring it back to a quote that, that Jay had earlier in this. You said when your back was against the wall, you generally played better. Well, our backs against the wall as a humanity right now, we have to decide if we have the desire to do what it takes to work together, yeah. to, to get better, right? Like, and you can see, I'm getting emotional because I care a lot about this. Like, I want us to win, dude. <laughs> and we may not, like we talked about earlier, you may, we may win this golf tournament, we may not, but we got to try our best. Yeah. No, but see, that's the thing is we will. We don't give, our, we don't give ourselves the options not to. Right. And you I just think will. You, you, and if you don't, you find a way to find out if you do. You find a way to find a way that you will win. Yeah. Right. And I you think find that some, that's find something that's in there. From this tragedy in the world is that we can find a way to win together. Yep. I think that's the biggest thing you just said is together. Like, I feel like nowadays people are so selfish. If they will help one another, I think everything would just go well, away. Everything would be better. Like I, like we, I said early on in the podcast, and I'll bring it back again because it's a good way to sort of wrap this up, is that one thing that cannot be denied that this thing taught us is that we are connected, which means we are in this together. We don't have to like it, and we don't have to like each other all the time. We do have to realize that we're in this together, and we should love and respect each other and encourage each other to do our best. We don't have to win. If someone else doesn't have to lose for us to win. We can all win together. That's a way different way of looking at the world. And I hope that we get there from this. I really do. Got to believe in humanity to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Which means you have to believe in yourself. Yep. We all have to start there. That like, Let me just do my best. I can't fix the whole world. I can just do my best. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So any, any closing thoughts you guys want to say before I stop recording, we can get to the good stuff. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. Cause I know Jay's got to get back to work because he's got a boss now for the first time. I do. I know. A, a, a male boss. I've always had a female boss, but <laughs> by the way, how are Megan and the kids doing? Everybody's great, man. Everybody's and good. You Peace guys, out. If you guys need a family Zoom and you're getting on each other's nerves, you got it whenever you want it. I'm there for it. We've actually been, we've actually been good. It's, uh, I've got like in our house in Jersey, we have a, uh, the people before us built a separate garage with an office above the garage. So it's a separate building. So I've got like my own space here. That's so it's great. like my own man cave. I got my, I got my, action up on the wall back over here Ours, i see a symbol on the wall there yep and it's a zildjian too okay good yep. good steel panther but um nice yeah um i love those guys those guys are amazing aren't they so my cool. buddies but um <laughs> it's uh so yeah it's it's been a, a little it's been nice to come over here and just kind of like like i said like i'm such a i've been so used to being by myself for so long that Sometimes you just get a little, and I, I love them to death. And but this has just been a nice little, like, you know, deep breath to kind of. And like I've said this many times before, it's like I'll always love my wife, but I actually still like her. Yeah, you know, like that's there's a difference. There's a huge difference, and and um, you know, it, we've got four acres here, so we had like the ultimate Easter egg hunt yesterday, and you know, our kids are getting old, but it's like get out there and find the damn eggs. Yeah, <laughs> do something outside. Yeah, get outside and find the eggs. And it was a nice yeah, day yesterday. Max is like uh, my nephews. They're oddly built for this. My two, two of my nephews are uh, 14, 15. And all they want to do is stay inside and play video games. That's like their oh. dream life. Oh, yeah. I feel, like I'm, I feel like I'm 12 years old again. And I stopped playing <laughs> video games. And that's like all there is to do now. I hate it, though. I'm so boring. Yeah, <laughs> I, have, I have, like, fought off the fact of, like, trying to – we have a – my son, we have a, I fought off buying a PS4 or an, an Xbox to, to like put up here. 
I'm like, you know what? I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Just, next thing I know, I'm going to be sitting here like. I know. My <laughs> parents would never let us get a console when we were kids. I worked. We had a bakery across the street from a, an arcade. So I got to make money and spend it all there, but not at home. And I fought with them and I called them every name in the book. And now I look back and I tell them, thank you so much <laughs> for not letting me get sucked into that world <laughs> yeah. on a daily basis. Tyler, what's, uh, what do you want to say and wrap us up here? Some words of wisdom from a um, young kid going through this. Not really much, honestly. I just, back to that book, like I said, um, it really, for me, yeah, plug your book. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> like, I, I, I don't enjoy reading or any of that stuff, to be honest with you. But when I got into this, I could actually connect to it. So I feel if you like golf, you should definitely read it. Even if you don't like golf, you have plenty of free time right now. So you might as well read it because I definitely had life lessons and connections from the book. So it was a, a, just a fantastic read for me. Well, that's cool. one hell of a plug. I don't even like reading, but I liked reading your book. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that's really the only book I've probably read uh, mm, since like maybe fifth grade, all the books you're supposed to read, I would just go on the internet and find summaries. <laughs> go ahead, Jay. You I can to... say that now. The good thing about your book is you can just open it up to any page. Yeah. You know, you open it up to any page and it just seems to kind of work with whatever you can. Yeah. Oh, look what I got. Is it backwards? I opened it up to the to chapter about not being a jerk, which is a really yeah. good one for everybody right now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can open up to any page and find something that you know, that, that relates to what you're going through. Just, you can just thumb through it and find something, but. Um, well, yeah, thanks so much guys. Great. Thanks for being on and thanks for the conversation. Um, and I, I want to end with a, what your dad's quote. There's no such thing as fun for the whole family. I love that, don't you? <laughs> Where, uh, you know, somebody's going to be miserable at any given point, but we, we pull each other through it and then we're still a family in the end. We still did it. That's the Zelosophy Podcast, episode 34 with Jason Gore and Tyler Scheiblick. I hope that uh, you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. I want to thank uh, Jason and Tyler for their open, candid conversation about the similarities b between life and golf and what we can learn from it all. Um, you may have noticed that on Zoom, my logo's backwards, but I record this on QuickTime, so it's not, I don't know, it's just a funny thing for those of you watching on YouTube. So a couple quick things to promote, and we'll get you out of here. The GoFundMe is up, free philosophy talks for heroes, kids, and families. Please go there and contribute. Uh, it would mean a lot to me, and more importantly, would mean a lot to a lot of people that need help and need perspective like this, like I give in the podcast, to be able to talk one-on-one -on -one with me or... Uh, as, me, as big as the group is, 10 on one, 20 on one, whatever, whatever is needed. I'm here to help however I can. Uh, Zelosophy TV with uh, Uncle LZ and Friends is on uh, YouTube. Please subscribe to that channel. You might be watching this on YouTube. Subscribe below. Uh, the Zelosophy podcast you're listening to. The book is Zelosophy on Golf. You can get it on Amazon. I want to thank... Um, uh, da, 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 who am I thanking? It's, oh, Captain Blackheart for the theme song Surf that I've been using on my podcast for uh, over, over a year now. Um, thank you for uh, to all the heroes out there that are doing yeoman's work, helping people stay safe, caring for people who are sick, feeding people, um, all of that. It's really great work. We are in this together. Let's try and act like it. We don't have to like each other, but we do have to work together. So. Let's do the best that we can. Thanks, and uh, more Zelosophy podcast coming at you soon. I got a lot of great episodes coming up. Ellen Spencer, who's an artist, is going to be here this week. And Eli Paperboy Reed, who I'm a huge fan of, one of my favorite singers out there, sort of an underground guy. You may or may not know about him, but he's an amazing singer and a really cool guy. And he's going to come on the podcast. We just have to find a time. Anyway, I'm sure there's lots more I can talk about, but I think that's enough for today. Uh, stay well out there. I'm Z and you're welcome.